We are at the top of the hour, so we'll go ahead and get started with today's webinar, Preparing for Fall, How Higher Education Administrators Are Planning for the New Normal. My name is Megan Raymond. I'm the Senior Director of Programs and Membership here at WCET. I've been with WCET about 13 years, it's hard to believe, and I'm so thrilled to be convening this group of people. I often say in my job that the best part of my job is that I get to talk to people that are doing incredible work and know all the things so that I can reach out to these people and connect them with you all so that you can learn from them and hopefully emulate some good practices. We are recording this webcast, so we will share the link in any resources that were shared and you will be able to access the slides today. So we don't have a lot of content in the slides, but we do have a list of resources that you'll find useful. There's some great, great content there. And otherwise, just enjoy. Feel free to post your questions in the Q&A. Try not to put it in chat because we lose track of the chat sometimes. There's a lot of chatty people and kind of lose track of the questions. But we'll get to your questions as we can. We will have some conversation with our panelists and then we'll look to see where your questions are at and bring those in. If we don't get to all your questions, we'll be sure to pull out some of those questions, share them with the presenters and get responses back to you. But feel free to engage in the chat with us and, and your colleagues. If you'd like to follow along on Twitter, the hashtag is WCETWebcast. We are very thankful to our partner D2L for helping pull this together. And again, if you have any questions, enter them into the Q&A. And we are moving right along. I know we have a lot to get through. So I'd like to pass it off to our moderator today, Dr. Jeff Borden. Jeff is a lifelong educator and he's the Chief Academic Officer at D2L. Welcome, Jeff. Thanks so much, Megan. Uh, it's so good to see you again uh, in, in a little bit different context for me, but uh, thanks. I'm, I'm really excited about this panel. So as Megan said, I'm a lifelong educator. Uh, I've been in higher education for about 23 years. Uh, I've been a professor. Uh, I've never taken a semester off, including summers. I, I teach somewhere all the time, but I'm also um, a presenter. I, I've delivered hundreds of keynotes, workshops, trainings, just about how to transform learning. And so it's really my honor today and, and privilege to be able to uh, try to ask some really important and poignant questions of our panelists who are experts in their own right. And so my job really is to serve, serve this up uh, on a platform for them to be able to give you some, some thoughts about what we're doing today. So I'd like to introduce to you our panelists. Uh, I'm gonna let them introduce themselves, but I'll just briefly, uh, I'll, we'll start with you Dr. Mordecai, if you don't know Dr. Mordecai, he's in my neck of the woods here in Colorado at the Community College of Aurora, but uh, you should check out his, uh, his web series on LinkedIn. He's got some really great leadership tips, but uh, Dr. Mordecai, do you want to tell us a little bit more about yourself? Thank you so much, Jeff. You're too kind and uh, honored to be here with you all. Uh, I had the pleasure of serving the Community College of Aurora as its president. I uh, also serve as a uh, higher ed columnist for EdSurge and uh, have been in higher education now for about uh, 16 plus years and just honored to be with you all today. Wonderful, thank you very much for joining us. Um, it's also my pleasure to introduce Tom Cavanaugh. I've known Tom for a number of years. Uh, we served on the Courseware and Context Framework Committee. Uh, I think that was funded by the Gates Foundation years ago when I was the Chief Innovation Officer at St. Leo down in Florida. Tom is one of those guys that he, he seems to come up in conversation all the time, all across the country. Everybody knows Tom. So, uh, Tom, you want to tell us a little bit about yourself, just in case somebody here doesn't know you? <laughs> <laughs> sure. I probably owe somebody uh, $20 or something somewhere. Um, yeah, I'm Tom Cavanaugh. I am Vice Provost for Digital Learning at the University of Central Florida. I've been at UCF for almost uh, 13 years, and I have responsibility for online learning and continuing education. Thank you. Thanks for being here. And then finally, uh, we're really um, we're really excited to have Pat James with us again she has been in and around higher education for years uh, as an instructor a professor a trainer uh, a consultant an advisor um, working with a lot of different groups and and constituents right now she finds herself in California uh, working diligently with the, the community college system out there Pat can you uh, say hi hi um, I'm Pat James and I have been an, an educator for Okay, over 30 years. <laughs> I started in K-8 schools in Northern California and, and just transitioned with my students through um, 
high school, junior high, high school, and then on to the California Community Colleges where I've spent most of my career. Um, I taught digital media production online back in 2002, which was crazy, and uh, uh, became an administ administrator at Mount San Jacinto College and then retired for the first time. And uh, there's been three or four retirements now, but retired for the first time and became the um, executive director of the California Virtual Campus Online Education Initiative. And I still am working with that group. And um, I get to teach teachers how to teach online through At One, the professional development arm of the California Community Colleges. And I also teach at Evergreen Valley Community College in San Jose, where I also get to teach teachers how to teach online. I love it. <laughs> Very good. Well, I, as I strongly suspect that people on the call know at least one of our panelists, uh, probably their, their work is known pretty well. So uh, I'm anxious to hear what you guys have to say. So with that said, let's jump in. I will just remind uh, the audience, I'm going to be following the Q&A and I will try really hard if, if questions come up in the q and I'll try to pepper them into the conversation that we're having so that we don't have to try to go back at the end and remind ourselves of something we were talking about 30 minutes ago. Um, if, if that happens, great. If not, we may have a little time at the end, so we'll, we'll see. But the, the goal is to just have this be very conversational. And then to my panelists, I would also say, hey, add thoughts to uh, questions. I'll try to pose them to any one of you at any given time. But if you have other thoughts, please jump in. So with that said, let's do it. Let's jump in. Um, you know, this webinar is about preparing for fall. And I think we actually use the term, you know, the new normal. I'm going to ask all of you. Is there a new normal? Can we call it that yet? Are we even in a place to be thinking about the new normal? I guess I'll start. Um, I, I think not yet, um, although um, I think we've started it, uh, this sort of transition into what, what we will become. Uh, I, I think maybe earlier this year, over the summer, we thought maybe we would be more normal, <laughs> uh, whatever that was before, than, than maybe we are now. But um, like just for example, at my campus at, at UCF, we, we, um, we do not have any uh, physical distancing requirements. We've got full capacity in our classrooms. We've got full occupancy in our dorms and our cafeterias and everything. Um, but... Uh, We've, we've been encouraging vaccines and we've been encouraging masks. Uh, we actually are, are not allowed to do mandates, but um, we're, we're doing a big campaign that kind of is, is uh, asking people to, to voluntarily do that. And we're getting a high, I think, uh, agreement there. So it's, it's not quite normal in that a lot of students are back. They're really happy to be back, but you know it's still different, right? Uh, there's still a, a lot of anxiety on campus, both from faculty and students, and and there's masks everywhere. So um, I don't think that will become the new normal. I think at some point those masks will go away, uh, but uh, but where, that's where we are right now for the fall. Yeah, I'd I'd love to hear. Uh... Mordecai, Pat, you also jump in. One of our uh, audience members said that at their school, they're using new possibilities, not new normal. Yeah, I'll jump in there, Jeff, and just say, uh, Heather, thank you for sharing that. I, I think that there certainly are new opportunities present. Uh, you know, the one thing that I would say that the conversations we've been having at uh, Community College of Aurora is that the realization that we cannot wait out COVID. What I mean by that is, uh, as, as we're watching these variants, these various variants, you know, on the news, we're hearing about Delta, but I will tell you, here at the uh, University of Colorado Anschutz campus, I just had a meeting there last week and they're talking about Lambda variant and the realities of, of what Lambda could be. And so I think that as educators, it's so important that we maintain this sense of readiness and be able to pivot uh, at any given time uh, for, for the, the sake of ensuring equitable student success. Uh, I think that this past year and a half, two years has certainly taught us something. Uh, and I think that we need to continue to have systems in place to continue to learn from our approaches uh, to instruction and to student support and be ready at any given time uh, to, to, to make changes uh, to ensure that we are having continuity of service. But I would say here at CCA, we're currently working with the Tri-County Health Authority uh, and we have a mask mandate in place uh, here within our classrooms. Uh, and as we think about our diverse communities in which we serve, um, you know, vaccinations, we continue to see some, some continued 
um, um, vaccination increase in rate, uh, especially since May, we've had, had almost a 20% increase in our student body. So we're really excited about that reality, but also in the community in which we dwell, um, there still is a lot of opportunity for vaccinations uh, to occur. And so understanding that we wanted to, to steer away if we could uh, for the sake of access and equity from the vaccination mandate. However, we continue to monitor the realizations in our community. So, so Pat, it sounds like the new normal is just, it's not normal right now. And that, that, is, our, that is our new normal. I know you I talk with it, a I lot hope. of administrators. You finding that too? Yeah, I'm hoping we're never normal again. Um, and what I mean by that is I would really like to see us, um, you know, keep the innovations that we've seen um, faculty involved with over the last two years, you know, particularly um, watching faculty learn what distance education can be, what online education can be, and how they might implement the technology they've never used before. And I'm now getting to teach those people. And I actually am teaching some people how to use a computer, which is really interesting. I'm wondering how they've gotten by this far um, in their careers without having done that. But I don't think, and I hope that we don't have a normal. I'd like to see a lot of innovation continuing. Um, there was a story that uh, I heard at a conference about five or six years ago from someone from Apple whose name I can't remember, and I'm sorry about that. But he said that, we need to be, um, we need to have a teaching practice that evolves, just like doctors and lawyers where things change and they evolve their practice to specialize, but then they broaden that as they need to. And I think that we need to start looking at ourselves as having an educator practice. Everyone's an educator, everyone from, you know, the grounds crew on campus, you know, to the president of the college, th that we all need to be educators all the time. And I, I'm hoping that we don't ever go back to normal, that we really take these lessons and go forward. You're getting a lot of hear, hears and applause from the, uh, the audience. That's, I, I, think I never liked good. normal anyway, spent my yeah, whole life good. in distance. Ed, so yeah. No, that's excellent. Well, so with that, with that framework, with that context in mind, uh, let's, let's dive in by constituent type for a bit. Um, we, again, folks in the Q&A are saying stuff like, you know, there are vaccine mandates, there are not vaccine mandates, there are mask requirements, not mask requirements. And uh, some folks are saying the new normal probably won't emerge until 2023, which is probably fair. But for this fall, I'd love to hear, what are you guys hearing from, let's start with faculty and staff. Um, what do you believe fall 2021 will look like for faculty and staff? Uh, Tom, let me start with you. Yeah, well, um, it, what's interesting is that, uh, you know, in 2020, as somebody who lives in distance education, you know, 2020 was a really interesting anomalous year where we hit this high watermark of 100% online. And that now we're no longer 100% online, but the water hasn't settled back to where it was pre-pandemic. It's, it's somewhere in the middle. It's much higher than it was. So we're seeing more distance learning, even with a push to get back on campus and students really, really want that. Um, but by the same token, like the non-faculty positions that, you know, so faculty might still have a requirement to teach face-to-face -face in a classroom, but for non-faculty positions, for staff positions, there's a real push towards remote and hybrid work. And um, that has become a, a, a new thing that I think will remain. So even in my own division, we have a hybrid work schedule that we're piloting through the entire fall that I suspect will probably continue. And the, the staff are only in the office two days a week uh, for the most part. Um, and, and that is an interesting, uh, set of waters to navigate now. How do we ensure that we provide the same level of service for faculty and students with a different kind of uh, work environment and modality? So far, so good. I mean, we certainly did it like so many others during the pandemic at 100% remote. Now we're trying to figure out how can we take best advantage of the uh, face-to-face -face components for collaboration and brainstorming and just you know social relationship trust building that sort of fosters innovation. Um, that that is uh, is still a bit of a work in progress, but it's entirely new uh, for fall 2021, 20, uh, and I think it will remain going forward. Pat, I think that 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 ties to what you were saying at the beginning, right? Let's take advantage of these innovations that we now have. Yeah. Are you hearing that with staff and faculty specifically? Yes, going I fall? yeah I am. They need they want more tools. They want more professional development. Um, they'd really like to see us start to work on rebuilding trust in higher ed for students because they don't feel that that's there right now. Um, 
you know, they're anxious about everything. And one, one teacher in the little survey that I ran said that she really wishes that people, that administrators would recognize and take seriously her concern, her health concerns, because she's immune, eh, immune, I can't even say it. Her immune system is compromised. There we go. And, um, and she wants to work but she doesn't wanna come back on campus. And I think we need to be more flexible. We're gonna develop a creative calendar that has to happen. And it's, I think the first time that we've really looked at not taking a calendar forward, you know, and taking the schedule forward every term because it's easier, but to really think about being creative. And when it comes to hybrid courses, um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm wondering about the high flex situation where people are gonna be broadcasting from a classroom and you know, I, I'm wondering about how that's going to really work in a, uh, to scale, but a hybrid where you can have a synchronous hybrid where um, you're online, where you're using web conferencing as the face-to-face -face component, component and you're using an LMS as the online component, component might be um, really easy to do when you learn about active learning, what goes in that synchronous area, and then easily switched to hybrid in the classroom if you need to. And so if you need to go back, you could take that hybrid in the classroom and just put it in the synchronous area if you understand how to do that. And so professional development is something that I think we're really gonna focus on. Short bursts where there's a lot of uh, one hour web conferences that teach a, a specific thing. And we're doing that here in a lot of our colleges and then we're saving those and sharing them, which is really effective and efficient way to you know really, uh, really make use of all our are just highly trained folks. We were really lucky because we had been doing online education for a long time. And the, the uh, online education initiative was able to provide all of the colleges with a single LMS with um, resources for how to do everything they really needed to do online, counseling and, and um, tutoring and all of those things that the accreditors are looking for that we figured out how to do. And so I think you know, that as we're, we're going forward, we need to, to really tie into how are the faculty feeling? And we'll talk about that probably a little bit later, but that anxiousness for all kinds of things is really top. Health concerns, I had one teacher say, I've never been more tired starting a new term than I am right now. And so recognizing that people need time and they need some care, I think those things are really gonna come up now as we start back and as we start to work in that. But that idea of a creative calendar is something that really um, is exciting to me because I, I really would like to see that and really make use of the hybrid situation as well. Yeah. So uh, as we think about, again, all the constituents, I, I, I realize that many on this call fall into the faculty and staff category. And so they're obviously worried about what their life is going to look like kind of moving forward. But let's also, you know, we, we have to talk about students uh, at the same time. In fact, somebody posted, um, you know, in, in the, the question and answer said, we're hearing students all want to come back to, to campus, but I don't know that that's true. I don't know why people are making that assumption. Um, and so there's a question, you know, what's best for students? What, what, what are we hearing about students? Mordecai, why don't, why don't we start with you on that one? Yeah, the, the one thing I would say in that regard, it's, it's so important to, rather than making generalities, that we as educators have systems in place to hear the voice of our students. Right, and so we can listen to what may be happening across the country, uh, but I think it's an error to then make an assumption as to what our particular college or university communities may need and want. I would say in this particular community in Aurora, we have heard from our students and the desire was that they wanted to be back in an in-class experience, the majority. So what we have done is we have found a way to uh, uh, provide that in seat experience while also having the high flex online remote options available as well. I would say if you had to look at a percentage breakdown, I would give it about a 70 in seat, 70% in seat, 30% otherwise. But the, the, the other part of that reality is, is that we uh, as, as a body uh, had to make determinations as to not only our modalities, but when we were offering these sections. Uh, and so that I think is the other element of this in terms of that continuous learning is to say that what we have traditionally offered between the AM hours now needs to be looked at as PM. Uh, understanding that individuals are happy that they now have a, a identified employment for themselves, whereas that has been a continued uh, crisis point for a lot of our students in terms of loss of employment during this crisis. However, now that they've landed jobs, they perhaps want to continue their instruction but cannot attend the AM classes. We need to be providing PM and late evening courses for those individuals and allow for them to have that sense of flexibility. And there's a word that I have to continue to, uh, to, to bring to the forefront, that is, is grace. 
So as we think about our students and serving our students, the conversations we've been having is to any opportunity that we have, we're not look, talking about reduction of rigor by any means, but we are saying where there are opportunities to create infrastructures for showcasing grace to support our students because now is truly uh, a point of crisis, yet they have entrusted us with their academic pathway. We wanna do everything that we can to serve them. Tom, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. I know that you, you know, you focus heavily on what students want, what students need. I, I know you do surveying and all sorts of stuff at UCF. Um, are are you hearing similar things with regard to your students? In fact, somebody asked in the in the the question is a great question that you might even address in this. How do we rebuild sort of the trust that we may have lost with some folks? And what are those core messages we think will resonate with students uh, as we as we move into fall? Yeah, well, I mean, really, to the to the first part of that, uh, I actually did type an answer to Camille in the uh, to that that question about is there really uh, demand by students, and and we are seeing yes uh, so far. You know, so we're a week into the not even a full week into our first week of classes, but I just came from a meeting literally right before this, and our our uh, VP for Student Development and Enrollment Services said that. It's just been like record setting engagement from students in like week of welcome and other kinds of student activity stuff. Like they, they just had this pent up demand for a year and a half to be on campus. We've got our FTICs, which are first time in college students, which are our freshmen. And we've got our FTOCs, which are first time on campus students. So there's like a whole sophomore class that are now on campus engaging in these things that they didn't get to do last year. So it's, it's really intensified that demand. Now that's not, as to Mordecai's point, it's not everybody, uh, but I would say it's a majority. There is a, there is a percentage of students who are concerned and would rather be 100% online. So even those students who are on campus engaging, um, they're still taking more online classes. Our student credit hours online are up significantly, 10% uh, over 2019-20. Uh, or more, uh, it's, it's pretty remarkable. So even though they're engaging on campus, they're also taking more online uh, as part of their schedule. Now, the question about trust in higher ed, um, it's a good one. And it's something that uh, Russ Poulin and I have been talking about from WCET um, because there, there seems to be recently uh, what I've been calling the great conflation <laughs> that, that is equating what happened during emergency remote instruction with the kind of intentionally designed high quality online learning that we've been doing for 25 years. And they're not the same thing. It's not to take away from all of the effort and resilience and creativity the faculty put into this remote instruction over the past year and a half, but it's not the same thing. And so I think we need to try and get out in front of that narrative a little bit and, uh, and, and help the the public who's maybe not as invested in online learning as we are understand the difference, not in a defensive way, but in an educating way, and then assure them that we have, we've learned a lot in the past year and a half, and we can take that and, and improve even more the really high quality stuff that we've been doing for more than two decades. Again, there's some applause smattering through there, Tom. That was a, I know that's a big one for anybody who's been teaching online for any length of time. That's anyway, a hashtag not. I'm trying to get started. The oh, great that's a great one. It's a great one. I, I completely 100% agree. And that's what I've been seeing and teaching these teachers too, who really are confused. You know, the ones who never taught online before are very confused about when you say, well, we're now, you know, teaching asynchronously online. They're going, well, we've been, you know, we're fully online. You can't say fully online anymore. And nobody understands what that means. And, you know, or a lot of people don't. So I think what you're saying is really important. Tom, the other thing I would say to restore trust is to really start heavily investing in collaboration so that we're asking our students what they think. We're involving them in what we're doing on campus. Bring them on to every committee you have if you can and really hope that they, they become uh, members, active members, encourage that and collaborate with them in your own classroom too. How is this working for you? What else do you need? Um, even ask them if you're using discussions or however you're communicating with them, you know, how are you feeling or do some reflection on that so that you're in touch with that. And I, uh, when we chose our course management system for the state, um, one of the things we had students helping us do that. And one of the things they said, <laughs> it just blew me away when I asked them what their takeaway was, was that it wasn't about what we chose. It was about the, the students said, 
I, I knew that you cared about us, but I never knew how much until this experience. You know, and, and so I think that we have to adopt. I have a T-shirt that says in the, on the front of it but that my daughter-in-law made that says it's all about students. And on the back, it says it's not about you. And um, I, don't, I haven't had the guts to wear it, although I should have worn it today, really. But I think we need to change our thinking to really be more about what's best for students. Ask yourself that question with every decision you make. Is this good for students? And then include them in that collaboration. You know, Jeff, I have to jump in there on that trust uh, conversation right now. I think that from, from an institutional standpoint, we um, at the colleges, the universities, and administration have been used to having ROI conversations about what the investments are in our systems and infrastructures and approaches uh, to our awards and, and enrollments. However, we can never forget that students are also having an ROI conversation with themselves. And I think that that's the other aspect of this trust conversation is that students are taking time and hard earned money in some cases where they truly don't have the abilities, yet they are still sacrificing and they're entrusting their institutions to get them from point A to point B. And so that trust factor is huge. And it's more important, uh, importantly, the reason why we must have uh, systems in place to hear the voice of our students, to meet their needs, and to truly have the systems and support systems in place uh, to ensure their success. You know, Mark, I sit, let me stay with you for a second on this, because I think even where some of the questions are going, you're really talking also about the bridging between the students' needs and experience, as well as how the administrators architect that experience. How are administrators handling this? I know we've got some on this, this uh, video call right now. How are they looking at capturing and then employing some of the things that we found in the pandemic that work? How do we keep them? You know, I think somebody asked, you know, will, will we kind of have this pendulum effect going back and forth between using the old, using the new, how will administrators put, how do they keep their eye on the ball if they're not even sure where the ball is? Well, you know, I think there, there's, there's a, um, a mental shift, a paradigm shift that must occur, I think, amongst uh, administrators, depending upon where they are in their paradigm, right? Um, and what I would say is, is that it is easy to look at enrollments and say, well, enrollments are down. We must pivot back to going back to how things have been versus using this as a time to say this is a new era of higher education, that, that we should use these times to really ask ourselves what we've been doing and if it's still relevant. And I think that relevance conversation must be had now more than ever. And it's not so much about going back to how things are. It's really adapting and making shifts and changes towards the betterment of students and what is truly student first versus institution first. And that is my hope and desire that during this season, during this period, that we can have more conversations about that. The other thing I would say, too, is the sense of urgency. It is, is we have some institutions colleagues that truly need to increase their sense of urgencies for ensuring the success of their students versus looking at continuing the agendas that were present pre-pandemic. And I think, again, if you keep students at the focus, uh, maintain the sense of urgencies properly for the needs of the students, and also ask the questions of relevancy. Are we truly meeting the needs of our students? Uh, I think will then get us to where we need to be from a mental standpoint. I think that's a that's a nice bow to put on our our uh, you know how how the different stakeholders are dealing with. Thank you guys. Um, let me let me pivot just a little bit. It's the same same issue uh, in terms of of stakeholders, but it's a different uh, aspect of learning. Uh, I've been really COVID for me was really quite something when, when it comes to publications. I've had four chapters and four academic uh, books come out this since 2019, which I'm, I'm excited about, but. In those, I talk about the, the real need that we know we have around not just studying and measuring cognition, but studying and measuring affection and what's typical, what's best termed conation, but what is thought of as grit, mindset, tenacity. So we know more than ever before that students who walk into classrooms not feeling like they have friends, not feeling like they have support, they, they struggle. In fact, in some cases, they're producing the wrong neurotransmitters and they literally cannot learn. Um, at the same time, those that don't believe that they can learn, that's a self-fulfilling prophecy for just about everybody. You know, K-12 talks about SEL a lot, and I, I wish we talked about sort of similarities. We don't. But they have figured out long ago that socio-emotional learning matters. In higher education, how do we, um, how do we deal with what, what, what students now need that is so much greater, perhaps, in terms of socio-emotional stuff, cognitive stuff, affective stuff, 
How are we designing for that? How could we or should we design for that to really make them feel safe? Tom, I'd love to start with you on that one. Yeah, well, I think it, it goes back to maybe the theme of what Mordecai said earlier, this idea of grace. Uh, we've been using the word empathy here, and um, it, it really came into high relief during the pandemic because I mean, we're in Central Florida where there's a lot of service, hospitality kind of industry, and so many of our students lost their jobs in the early days of the pandemic. Fortunately, things seem to be getting, getting better, but at that time, uh, students were really worried. I mean, besides all of the health and safety concerns, which were enormous, there was also just, how am I going to pay my rent? And it became like, how, I have to worry about this paper when I got to worry about if I can eat or not, or I can make my car payment. Uh, and so just taking a step back and having empathy for these students. Um, one anecdote that I've shared in the past, we had one particular student who um, was homeless. So I don't know if she was couch surfing or what her exact circumstances were, but her, uh, her computer that she was using uh, was having technical problems. She was able to get a loaner from the library before we all had to go remote, but, um, but it had problems and there was nobody on campus to help her because we were all 100% remote. And so she called our online helpline because she had, didn't know who else to call. And that kicked off uh, a series of conversations between my technical support team and uh, our UCF CARES office, which handles sort of case management for students, our IT department, our uh, UCF libraries. And, and we probably had two or three dozen people having conversations just to help this one student. And that was just one example of the kinds of things that happened during the pandemic. And now we've got processes that we put in place during the pandemic that we're gonna carry on uh, going forward. So now we know what to do even not in the midst of a crisis to help students like this. I, I, but it, again, it goes back to empathy. Pat, I know, I know you work with a lot of faculty, training them, teaching teachers how to teach kind of thing. Um, again, in, in one of those chapters I wrote, we often hear, I don't have time. I don't have time to, to worry about their socio-emotional well-being. I don't have time to worry about whether they have friends. I don't have time. And what we're now starting to realize is you really can't afford not to have that time, not to make that time. How are you uh, now kind of, again, going into this time of heightened exposure to the needs of people emotionally and psychologically and with support? How are you working with faculty uh, today? Well, I'm talking to them about that idea of grace. And um, it came up in my, my survey often. People, more than one person said it. It's a huge thing. And it's something that we need to have for everybody. You know, faculty for students, administrators for faculty, students for faculty too. Um, you know, we need to give each other that that grace. And so, what I'm working with um, with our teachers is not to be so rigid. You know, the idea of rigor, um, and you know, Mordecai, you brought up that term. The idea of rigor, um, if you look it up, it says rigid. You know, um, the the dictionary version says rigid. In higher education, we don't think about it that way. We think about, you know, maintaining the um, quality of our discipline and, you know, and, and we have to do it this way. And some people, you know, when I hear teachers say this in, my, in the classes that I teach, I just kind of go, oh my God, please, you know, don't say that. I'm teaching them how to be good employees by getting everything in on time. And that's not my job. Uh, I, you know, if I'm teaching um, career tech, it might be, and I would be talking to them about that. But generally, if I'm teaching teachers, my job is not to make sure that they have the best work ethic in the world. My job is to teach them my discipline, is to give them the information they need to be able to uh, be creative within that discipline and to be able to apply it, those sorts of things. And so when I hear people talk about that kind of rigidity, like I, um, I do not, I do not uh, allow late work. And I'm going, really? What if I end up at the hospital? You know, well, then I do. Okay, so is that in your policy somewhere? Or because of all this that's happening, um, I have a colleague, Michelle Pekansky Brock, you guys may have heard of her. Um, she talks a lot about humanizing. And she talks about late policies as being a target. Um, the bullseye is to turn it in on time. 
but getting close to the target should be something that's discussed as well, because that's important too. And so that grace, I think, extends to allowing students to tell you what's going on in their lives. Sure, some of them will abuse that, but most of them won't. More, more students appreciate that, we're finding. And so trying to talk to teachers about how to be less rigid, how to um, think about what rigor really means, you know, and, and to us, it's more flexibility generally. Um, and it's to get students to think critically. You know, that's really what rigor should be for us now. Um, and so I talk about that a lot with, our, with the teachers that I teach, but I also ask them about what kind of students they are. I, recently, I was noticing that they weren't reading all the stuff that they needed to read in order to be able to do the, assign, the assignment or listening to the videos or whatever. And so I did a video about, so you have a teaching practice. What's your student practice? Would you like to have a student like you in your class? And that brought up a lot about, whoa, you know what? I've been skipping over a lot just to get to the assignments. Now I get it. Um, one teacher said, um, I now have to, I now realize that I can't as, ask students or students to meet me where I am. I have to meet them where they are. And that was, that was a big one. So, yeah. So that's what I am working yeah. on with the teachers I teach, that flexibility, that grace, that understanding that particularly now that our students are really in need of that. Oh, that's uh, it's music to my ears. Uh, <laughs> as, you know, as I'm doing this writing, I'm doing all, all obviously lit reviews and research and Unfortunately, there's so many works out there, Cracks in the Ivory Tower, The Case Against Education, that say we're not teaching students how to critically think. We're not teaching them how to problem solve. Um, and we're also not really teaching them the discipline stuff either. So there's, there's work to be done, absolutely. Um, and Jeff, Jeff there's, a, yeah. um, there's an article that was out in uh, the Chronicles of Higher Ed just recently um, called A Trauma-Informed Return to Campus. And it's in mm -hmm. some of the resources that you'll get at the end of this, but that's at... Um, University of Wisconsin at Milwaukee, and um, they're doing some really major things I'll talk about more, but that's really a good article to take a look at for that kind of stuff. And just for people on the call, you'll get this, uh, the PowerPoint deck, and it's got those resources in there, so you'll, you'll be able to see those. Um, so let's pivot yet again a little bit. Um, in fact, there's a perfect question from my good friend Hester out there. Hi, Hester. It's good to see you. Um, she asks, with the, conflation, with the conflation of remote and online learning, do you think that we will need a whole new language to describe modalities? And I think that can play in the next question that I wanted to talk about, which is non-higher ed is seeing a, a surge of people re working remotely now. There are a lot of people who have given up their offices. They don't, they've just figured out they don't need them. They don't need people to be there in person necessarily. I know that's uncomfortable for some leaders uh, because they've never done that before. But then when you go to higher ed and you've got the same requests coming in from employees that don't necessarily have to be there because maybe they aren't student facing, how do we deal with that? Uh, we, we often in higher ed can't afford to compete against non-higher ed jobs that are, that are also rem remote. So they get the benefits of remote and more money. Um, how do we keep good people, especially when we may struggle to compete you know, financially? I'd, I'd love to hear from, from Tom and Mordecai on this, I know, and maybe you can also address if we're gonna need a whole new set of, of words and, and semantics to go with us, Tom? Um, yeah, well, I've, I've tried to be throughout the, I'm not always successful, but throughout the pandemic, tried to be really disciplined in, in the, the vocabulary that I use. So try and refer to what happened during the pandemic as emergency remote instruction, not call it online learning. <laughs> not everybody picks up on those subtleties, but it, it means something to me. If somebody asks me, I will be happy to explain it to them. So that I think that's part of it, uh, and maybe if we could all be consistent in doing that, that that becomes maybe more of a thing that is generally understood and, and accepted. Um, you know, back to the the question about hybrid work uh, that I alluded to earlier, and that was part of your question. Um, institutions are kind of uh, of higher education are are essentially very conservative in in their you know willingness to you know, try different things and be out there on the edge. And it's one reason why we've all been pushing online learning so hard for, for so long, because it's different. Um, and I, I think hybrid and remote work is the same thing. And I, I'll be the first one to admit, I, I've been on my own journey on this, because I, I had a, a probably a bit of a predisposition to favor face-to-face. Uh, -face. Um, and during the pandemic, uh, it's forced me to reevaluate my own preconceptions and 
Uh, I'm I'm 100% behind this remote work experiment that we're doing right now with with people out of the office more than they're in the office and and trying to make this work. And I don't think I'm alone based on the colleagues that I've talked to that are kind of struggling with this, trying to find the right balance. Uh, and maybe the last thing I'll say on it is um, I think it's entirely dependent upon your job. I mean, as you said, uh, student facing, if, if you need to be on campus and be interacting with students, or if you've got a job, if you're mowing the lawn, you know, it's hard to do that on Zoom. So uh, it's really important that it be based on the actual job, um, not based on, you know, individual personal preferences. Although I have seen those those robotic uh, mowers, you know, they, they do exist. I know they're out there. Um, Mordecai, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. You you manage people, uh, a lot of people, and you're really the top dog at the institution. How are you kind of working with this yin and yang push and pull? How are you keeping people, especially good people, you don't want to lose? Absolutely. You know, one thing, and, and I just put uh, my, my recent article in, uh, in the chat there, it, it has to happen. The transition has to happen to the academy truly embracing remote education, uh, remote uh, work, excuse me, workplace uh, uh, accommodations. Now, here's the thing. It comes down to infrastructure, right? And I think that especially in the community college space is what I can certainly speak to that I had many colleagues that during the pandemic, this was a very fearful time for them because truly their institutions did not have the proper infrastructure uh, in place to support students during this time. Now, granted, there's been a lot of uh, updialing during this time period, but now we are back in the office. So I think that during this time, I go back to that conversation uh, earlier about relevance and, and urgencies. Now is the time, rather than looking back at this as a returning back to the office, let's take all of what we've learned and now begin to talk about increased efficiencies. And as there are true health care, health concerns uh, of individuals uh, uh, through the pandemic, and uh, you heard Pat talk about uh, some of the colleagues that she's now had conversations with uh, out of these concerns. Not only do we need to meet and address those on a case by case, but now is an opportunity for true systems change. And the question becomes is where can we increase efficiencies? Where can we integrate more technology and have more innovation in the workplace? And I think that institutions really need to use this as an opportunity to be more outcomes driven. If there's a desired outcome that you have on how to service a student, there are many means in which to get that done. And one of those being remote and alternative work scheduling uh, and doing so at a distance. And it could be achieved, if not even more effectively. So I think institutions certainly need to put a full strategic commitment towards evolving in their approach and service. Oh my gosh, the outcomes-based approach, just like it, it's so valuable in learning. You're right, it's so valuable in work. Um, I, I'm gonna go again off script a little bit here. I, I, do, I did see Tom and Pat, you were typing an answer to the question, but I think it's worth everybody hearing. How do, you, how do we keep students safe when we've got remote instruction taking place? So, so thinking now of the remote teacher specifically and the remote student, how do we make sure that they have a safety net so we're not losing them? Um, I, I don't know what you typed, I couldn't see it, but, but I'd love to know, does anybody have any thoughts or anything in place to make sure that those students are not wandering off into the desert and not getting help? It's for the whole panel. I don't, I, I'm not thinking about necessarily about having anything in place, but that compassion in the remote or the online class is really important. The other thing I think that, um, that I've seen really work well is to understand when you're doing live teaching to do active learning and, you know, and really considering where things belong. And you know, my, my rule of thumb for being in a live space with students, whether it's um, in class or um, online in a hybrid setting is to find out what they need the most help with. And then that's what you that's what you're going to do when you're when you're with them in a live setting of some kind. It's just give them what they need um, the most help with, so they don't feel like they're losing. And also provide resources for them. Uh, one of the things the OAI did in the very beginning was to make sure that the, all students had access to online counseling. You know, all students had access to online tutoring. All students, you know, whether they be taking an online class or on the ground. You know, we provided those resources so all the colleges had them. And, and OEI is still doing that. And it's really been helpful. We were able to transition really well because we had all that in place. You know, and um, I think it takes a while to come to that realization that 
students are going to need all those resources that you give to your face-to-face -face students. I mean, you're on campus. See, I have to change my language, Tom. <laughs> you know, I keep trying, <laughs> but we have to provide them with that and then just show them, you know, show them that we care and keep in touch with them. So when you're teaching a class, even teaching my teachers, if they don't, if they don't show up for three or four days, I check in with them. What can I help you with? And that's what I ask them. I notice you're not turning in things like you should be, you know, you really need to get this in. Instead of doing that, I ask them, well, how I can help them so that they know that we're there to help them. You know, I think that's probably the most critical thing. Um, that Again, back to that trauma-informed return to campus article, um, the, they're doing a, um, a process, they have a trauma-informed toolkit, and they're doing a process of training people and these are the principles that they're teaching. Safety, trustworthiness and transparency, peer support, collaboration and, and mutuality, empowerment and choice, and cultural humanity and competency. And when I saw those, I did a little happy dance because that's exactly what is needed right now. So what they're doing, they have a training they've put together and they're training orientation leaders, faculty and staff, anyone who wants it. And, you know, we've done a lot of, professional development in the last two years, but we haven't done that. And, uh, you know, so I'll just throw that out there as yeah. a recommendation. So I, I love, I love the, the personal responsibility and accountability that, that you're, you're sharing with teachers. Uh, I'm curious, Mordecai, Tom, is that, I, that obviously has to translate culturally, right? That has to become a, a culture of support, a culture of commun communication uh, connection. I remember hearing Jeff Bezos talk about back in the day that, you know, somehow people would find non-support people at Amazon and they would contact them. They would say, I had a problem with X, Y, or Z. And it was those people's job to shepherd that concern over to the right, the right place and to follow back up to make sure that it was responded to. Um, culturally speaking, are there, are there things we can do to really promote that at our schools? Uh, are there technologies that we, can, that we can implement to try to help make sure that that happens again with that notion of not losing any of those student problems or issues that come up. Thank you, Tom. I'll, I'll jump in there and just say that uh, there's a phrase that I've used for years, Jeff, and I would say uh, that 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 uh, that phrase is, if you admit them, them being students, if you admit students, then you must serve. Um, and I, I think that that is where um, we have an ethical responsibility. But here's the other side of that coin. When it comes to our faculty uh, and our instructors, uh, if you hire them, you must serve them and support them. And I think that during this time, I, I fear as though there's been too many instances where uh, higher education institutions have failed to properly support their faculty and instructors during this time. So just as we talk about caring for students, we must care for our faculty. We must care for our instructors uh, and provide those same resources. Figuratively speaking, it's very hard to genuinely tell someone they're beautiful uh, that they deserve the world, yet you feel ugly and uncared for yourself. And so what do we do then from an equity lens standpoint to ensure that equity through and through, not only for what we provide to our students, but what we're also providing to our faculty and instructors as well as staff, uh, it has to be on par so we truly have the proper synergies in place and all of you are feeling cared for in our communities. And I fear that what, what has happened over time is, is that more and more now you have true educators with the passion and cares and concerns to ensure student success are truly feeling like they're working at a factory, uh, essentially. And their, their only job is to get students from A and B. And rather than focusing on the individual, it's now about the numbers and it's about the metrics. And we need to be very careful uh, and very intentional about steering away from those realities and truly ensuring care and empathy and grace and, and, and support throughout the academy as a whole. I don't disagree with any of that. And maybe the one thing I'll add, just to kind of touch on part of your question, which was about technology, um, is that I, I think we're on the verge of maybe the, the era of analytics. Um, there, the, the ubiquity of online learning over the past year and a half has really, I think, kind of pushed so many more people into learning management systems and other, and other online uh, platforms on campus, uh, but especially the LMS that um, will be able to, to leverage those data 
to identify students who are at risk. We can be a little more proactive to intervene, to try to assist those students on a much more real-time basis than we've ever really been able to do before. And for, for some schools, our school and others like ours have been using uh, the LMS pretty ubiquitously anyway, but I think there are a lot of schools that are only now coming out of the pandemic that have been in that position. And it's an opportunity for us to, to um, exploit, to use maybe a, a bad term, but to take advantage of the, the data that are in there in the service of student success so that we can help those students that you're talking about. We don't lose them, uh, but it also helps faculty because it gives them insight into their own students and allows them to prioritize who to spend time with and, and who they should talk to first. Uh, and at the end of the day, it's all about um, student graduation and success. Yeah, I, we were just having a, an internal conversation with some of my D2L colleagues about this very thing. And I was talking about some analytics that we had done at a previous LMS that I was with, where we found that um, classes that had had an activity in week one, their students were three times more likely to complete that class than, than classes where they had no activity in week one. And, and I get it, the common sense sort of wisdom is, well, there's so much flux and adding and dropping, I don't wanna, I don't wanna burden anybody, but you don't start to build that inertia, that momentum. Well, we wouldn't have known that had it not been for the data. Uh, we, it, we would have just gone along with sort of the conventional wisdom and not really seen what you're talking about. I think that's a, that's a really astute point. So, so panelists, uh, we're coming in on 10 minutes left. I think we've handled the questions pretty well. So I wanna get to some specific questions for your sectors and then we'll have one last sort of overarching question. Um, so for, for Pat and Mordecai, I'd love to ask you specifically, what are some of the unique challenges community colleges are facing moving into fall? I know you've got some, I know you probably have a list a mile long, but if you were to pick, you know, top two or three, uh, what, what's on your mind when it comes to fall this year? Okay, I'll, I'll start. Um, actually what I, yeah, um, this is one of our teacher's quotes that uh, Megan is putting up there right now. And it's just, it's pretty amazing. Uh, I'll let you read it on your own, but really for us and the community colleges here in California, we have to serve our community. And that means now the entire state. So just trying to get people to recognize that um, any student that comes to any campus, any, any college within our system is a student that belongs to all of us. And that that's something that we have to really start, you know, looking at. But the, I think the biggest thing is we have such a diverse student population. And, you know, we have people from all walks of life, from every economic stat, uh, status there could be, and they all can just come and we don't have, you know, it's, it's not like we take the top 10%, we take the top 100% of all the students in California. And so we have to recognize that and, and not forget what we've learned this last year about equity, that we really need to keep that going. Some of the teachers mentioned that to me, that they're afraid that we'll step back um, and won't remember some of those lessons that we learned at the very beginning of the pandemic when we were learning how to deal with COVID. We were also learning about how to deal with the social issues that have been raised. And all of those things come together uh, in a community college system. You know, we also have people who need to learn to teach because our focus is on teaching. And so you can't necessarily tell a discipline expert, um, I'm going to teach you how to teach because they'll go, what? No, I you know, I have a doctorate in this, da, 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 you know, but you can tell them, I'm going to teach you how to teach online. And they go, oh, okay. So use that platform. And I think Tom would agree with that. Use that space to teach people how to teach and how to respond to students. Or Mordecai, you probably have more about that. You know, you, you my friend, you, you have already uh, said so much, right? The, the one thing I would say is, and I've heard, uh, I heard a good friend of mine say this years ago, Community colleges represent the Statue of Liberty of higher education. Uh, our commitment to access, our commitment to opportunity, uh, our commitment to the empowerment of all uh, has to remain at the forefront of everything that we do. Uh, the digital divide has been very real. 
uh, and so many different communities served uh, during this particular time. And as we look at just um, the, the, the demographics of which community colleges serve, primarily being in the uh, urban areas, uh, areas and uh, also in the rural spaces, as even some of these travel spaces, this has been a very hard time for a lot of the communities in which have been served. And so I think that if we maintain the commitment to access and opportunity for all, means that we have a responsibility, especially in the community college space, to really clear the path and relook at how we've been resourcing uh, the the the, um, the the academy and really say what more what are the uh, additional resources that we should be providing to students and providing to our faculty and staff to ensure that our productive grade rates and our awarding our credentialing and true empowerment of our students serve uh, is fulfilled and uh, I think that's our responsibility and certainly the conversations in which we're having now on our commitment to ensuring that. Thank thank you both for that. I, it, it's. It's been uh, really lovely to me throughout this entire conversation to hear everyone coming back to the whole student, the whole person, the whole learner, and same for staff and faculty, the whole person, the whole, the whole employee. Um, and that really is evident even in, in those, last, those last answers that you gave about the community college challenges. Thank you. So just like I asked you about sort of your world, let me, let me go to Tom for a second. Um, so Tom, I think you and I talked about when I was in Florida you have probably had to deal with something more often and much sooner than most people in this COVID context. Uh, the hurricane, hurricanes are real and they, they really uh, interrupt and disrupt uh, higher education in Florida all the time. We know that, you know, climate's getting worse. It's going to, everything's getting more extreme. So whether it's the fires in California, the hurricanes in Florida, uh, the flooding in the Midwest, whatever, whatever it might look like, we're going to have more and more and more times when we have to try to engage learners online who had no intention of being online. But again, you've been doing that longer than probably most of us in Florida. What did we, what did, what do you bring to us that we might be able to take with us into 2021 and 2022 as we consider that as part of the new normal? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, and maybe I'll reiterate kind of what I typed out to Preston in answer to, to the question he asked, because one of the, I think, lingering echoes of the pandemic is, is uh, synchronous online instruction. I, I think it's going to be here to stay. Um, we weren't doing much of it, at least in my institution, prior to the pandemic, and, and we're doing it now. But I think in order for that to become an enduring practice, it's going to have to get better. And I think we're going to have to put the same kind of quality infrastructure around synchronous online instruction that we have around asynchronous online instruction. So that includes things like faculty preparation, faculty development. It includes assessment and really objectively looking at the outcomes of these kinds of modalities. And then maybe the last part of that is um, looking at the platforms. We've been really, I think, uh, creative in the use of meeting platforms, like the one we're in right now. But it's not an instructional platform. It's a meeting platform. It's good for lecturing. Um, maybe you could do a breakout group or use a whiteboard or something. But there are platforms in development right now that are kind of just hitting the market that we're starting to evaluate that are much more optimized for an instructional online synchronous experience than this kind of square peg in a round hole we've been using of a meeting platform to use as instruction. And I think that will help to improve the quality going forward too. So, you know, if there's maybe a big thing we learned um, uh, over the past, you know, 20 years of, of doing this, and especially um, uh, in, in the context of hurricanes where we have to bug out all the time, uh, is uh, to apply the same quality infrastructure that we've always used to these new practices that have shown up during the pandemic. Oh, that's, that's a fantastic point. I love the, the round peg in the square, you're right. So can I just can I just add to that that please. we've started a class actually in live teaching and that started a few months ago. So again, the brainchild of Michelle Pukansky Brock, but so professional development and live teaching is probably a good idea. Yeah. Well, to my panelists, I, I really want to say thank you. Uh, your your answers have been really wonderful to hear, thought provoking. I know we've had a lot of chat going on. I've been trying to watch some of it as it has been go going through, but uh, the questions and answers, thanks for, for those of you that posted questions. But those of you in the audience, I hope you'll help me in thanking uh, Tom and Mordecai and Pat for their time here. A little virtual applause for you there. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for, for all that you've done. 
it was a it was an honor and a pleasure for me as well as for D2L to be able to support this. Uh, Megan, let me turn it back to you with the 45 seconds we have remaining. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Jeff. This was a great conversation and I enjoyed all the side conversations and lots of good resources shared. And we'll be sharing the link to the recording back out with you and feel free to share that with your colleagues. And again, WCET is here for you. We like to make your job easier by sharing good practices. So consider joining our community if you're not already part of our community. I quickly wanna acknowledge our sponsors and our WCET supporting members. These organizations underwrite our work here at WCT and we're very grateful because then we can bring high quality conversations like this to you. And we are announcing our back to school special for the annual meeting. This will be a virtual annual meeting and hopefully our final <laughs> virtual annual meeting. We miss seeing everybody, but we have incredible content that will be taking place on November 2nd with some pre and post conference activities. So check out the program and make sure to bring a team. Again, thank you everybody. Be well and take care this semester.